Wonderful. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, so welcome to the third Wednesday evening, uh, sort of post-COVID, and the first stargazing. This is the first time we've got actual stargazing since February 2020, which is very exciting. We're going to see if we can remember how to do things. Uh, so yes, yeah, so after our wonderful headline speaker, we're going to go out and we're going to have a, a guided tour of the night sky and look through some telescopes. But before that, we get to hear what uh, maybe the best telescope ever made is doing. Uh, so I'm here with uh, Dr. Sandro De Keller from the, uh, the Cavendish Laboratory, and he's going to be telling us all about how JWST is telling us interesting things about galaxies. So over to you, Sandro. Okay. Um, yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and you know to be talking to you today. Um, so Matt told me I can talk about everything except about um, you know over thirty minutes, I guess. And I understand that because I think all of you want to really you know see the night sky and not just images. But um, I want to give you a bit of an overview of what kind of we're doing here um, concerning research about like finding the first galaxies. And in particular now with a new space telescope that we just put up into space a few months ago. So the research that, that I'm leading with my team um, concerns galaxies. These are these structures that you can see here in the sky. Um, galaxies consist of billions of stars. We have black holes in the centers. We have the dust and gas in the galaxies. And what we can see when we look out at the night sky, we can see actually a large diversity of galaxies. Um, and you can see this in this image here that galaxies come in all kinds of different colors. Some galaxies are quite blue. They are forming a lot of new stars. And some other galaxies, um, you know, seem to be quite boring, kind of more elliptical looking. And so our research concerns to understand, you know, why did we end up today with such a diversity of galaxies? What are the key physical ingredients, you know, that lead to an universe that we observe today? And also, um, what is our own sp place within this universe? But let me start with something a bit more on, on the Earth. I think, you know, last, last weekend, I think we all had a few thunderstorms. Um, so maybe some of the kids, what did you see when you see a thunderstorm? What do you observe? Yes? Uh, lightning the lightning, right? Yeah, so you see a lightning. What else do you see? Yes? Thunder, thunder yes. And what do you hear? A, a loud thunder, yes. What do you want to say? Yes. Yes? And what, what happens first? Is first the light or is first the sound? Yes? Ah, oh, yes. It sounds like dinosaurs from heaven, right? But what is first? Is first the light or first the sound? Yes? The lightning is first, right? And, and why is that? Does somebody know? Yes? Yeah, you can. Yes? Yes. So the light is first. And the light is first because the light waves are traveling much, much faster than the sound waves, right? And so you can see here, right, that there is, you know, for example, you that, you know, observes the lightning and you can see the light basically immediately appearing, but the sound comes a bit, you know, delayed. And this is because the light travels really, really, really fast. It's not as, uh, it's not infinite, actually. We can actually measure and, and, and you know, come up with a number. It's, it's over 100,000 miles per second. And so on Earth, this is basically immediately, right? But the sound itself is much slower, actually. It's only about you know, 700 miles per hour, or you know, turning this around into seconds, it's about 0.2 miles per second. And so if you are you know, kind of at a certain distance, you can actually use this information to infer how far away the thunderstorm is. So you, know, you just take the time it takes you know, for the sound to arrive after the flash. So for example, it's five seconds, right? You observe the flash, the sound comes five seconds later, and then you take this number that you get, you divide it by five, and you end up with the distance in miles. So, you know, in that case, the, you know, if it's a five second difference, it would be at the distance of, a one, of one mile. And so we use this information also when we want to measure distances in space. So what I show you here is Earth, right? The next object in space is the moon. So the distance from the moon to Earth, you know, which is kind of the closest object that we can get to, is 240,000 miles. And you see that already this is a significant distance. And so what astronomers do is we express this distance now with actually the time it takes light to travel. 
So if he would send out a laser from the moon to the Earth, it would take about one second to arrive here. And so he would say the moon is about one light second away from us. And so we can keep going. OK, let's look at the closest star, the sun. Now, this is not to scale. OK, so if I would, plot, you know, if I would show you the Earth to the scale of the sun, you see this small dot? OK, this would be the Earth. So you can place about one million Earths inside you know, the sphere of the sun. So the sun is much, much larger than what is shown here. And the distance to the sun um, is much further than to the moon, of course. And it is about you know, over 90 million um, miles. Now, if you express this in the light measure again, this corresponds to about eight light minutes. So this means the light takes about eight minutes until it arrives here on Earth. So if the sun would explode now, which it doesn't, so don't worry, but if it would, we would only know in eight minutes because light is the fastest thing that travels in space. So there's nothing faster than light. But it still takes eight minutes, actually, for the light to travel. And now we can, of course, look out at the sky. And today we don't see exactly this, probably, because you know we have a bit too much light pollution. But we will see, a, we will see this, OK? This is Jupiter. Um, we can see here this kind of, you know, nice band, which is actually our own galaxy. It's the Milky Way. And what you see here are the stars, basically in the foreground, that are close to us. And then this Milky Band here are actually hundreds, millions of stars that all kind of come close together and it looks like a blurry thing. But if you would have a telescope and look at that region, you see individual stars, actually. So if you zoom out from the galaxy, Okay, from our own galaxy, the Milky Way, this will look something like this. This is not exactly the Milky Way because, as you will see, we, we are not able to leave our own galaxy and take a picture of it because the distances are just too enormous. But this is our neighboring galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. Also, we can observe it hopefully later today. And so this is roughly, you know, this is roughly a picture of how we think that our galaxy also looks. And so where is the sun? The sun is a small, little, you know, tiny speck somewhere in the outskirts. It's not in the center. It's actually quite far away from the center. And what happens is that in the, you know, like all the stars, they move around the center of, um, you know, of the, of the galaxy itself. Now, it takes about 20 million years for the sun to travel once around the galactic center. So, you know, two, uh, sorry, 200 million years. Now you say, like, well, is, this so, is the sun moving so slow? And then I say, no, no, it's actually quite fast. It moves you know, with about 100 kilometers per second, so it's really, really fast. So why is it taking so long? Well, this is because the distance is just huge. So we are about 25,000 light years away from the center of the galaxy. So again, you can think about this, right? If we would observe something now happening in the center of the Milky Way, for example, when we observe the black hole and see something accreting onto the black hole, we observe this today, but this happened actually 25,000 years ago. And so you can see that if you start looking at things that are really distant, we are looking actually into the past. And just, you know, here's the number in miles, right? So I, I don't want to express this number. You know, that's why we start measuring things in light units and not anymore in miles. Or me in kilometers, because I'm from Switzerland. Okay, so now... Well, this image looks very clustered, right? There seems to be a lot of stars, but actually most of those stars are actually in the foreground within our own galaxy. And it's just because we take a picture out from our own galaxy, you can see all these dots. But of course, as I said, like in a galaxy, typically we have a few billion, you know, stars. So there are a lot of stars. And you go ask like, well, you know, how far apart are actually stars in a galaxy? And so I try to give you here, you know, not just an exact number, but actually kind of a comparison. Okay, so let's assume now you know, let's shrink the stars, like the sun, the sun is a typical star, um, to the size of our thumb. Okay, so let's just shrink it. And including, we shrink everything down, the, also the distances between the stars, um, and all the stars, you know, will be thumbs, basically. And the question is, okay, I have a thumb here, how far away is the next thumb, uh, you know, in order to think of, like, how far away is actually the next star? And the answer to this is, like, well, it's roughly the distances between the capitals in Europe. So this means that there is a star, which is my thumb, and then you have to go, for example, to Paris, and that's where basically the next star will be. So there's a lot of empty space in between with basically nothing, a few planets, us, and, you know, a bit of gas, a bit of dust. So it's, it's, it's a really empty space. Now, if we zoom out from our own galaxy, the Milky Way, 
you can see that there are actually quite a few other galaxies around us. And this is called kind of the local group. So there are these, we call them dwarf galaxies, because they are much smaller than our own, the Milky Way galaxy. And the next to it, you can see here, is the Andromeda galaxy. This is, you know, the largest neighbor that we have. And now the question is, of course, how far away is the Andromeda galaxy? And here we're not talking of thousands or 10,000 or 100,000 of light years. Here we're talking of, you know, 2.5 million light years. And this is our next really major galaxy. And again, I just give you here a rough reference of like what happened over the last 2.5 million years on Earth. Um, very, you know, human specific. Um, but you can see that the Homo sapiens, you know, is actually quite young. So if they would have a super telescope on Andromeda and you look at Earth, you know, they would see not the Homo sapiens, but they would see the Homo habilis. Okay, so it's really looking back in time. Okay, so how do we do these discoveries? Well, for this, actually, we need to work in large teams. And so what I show you here is the very large telescope in Chile. We have actually not just one telescope, it's actually four telescopes. And so here is what you don't see inside. This is the mirror, and there is a human being in, inside, right? These mirrors are roughly eight meters in diameter. And the idea of a telescope is, is to collect all the light. Because, you know, if you go into a dark room, what happens to your eyes? Any of the kids? You know, what happens to your eyes if you go into your room? Into a dark room. What happens to your eyes? Yes? Sorry? Yes, exactly. So the pupil's getting larger and larger, right? Because you, what you want to do is you want to collect more light so that you can see in the dark. And the same thing, you know, happens with a telescope. What you do, actually, is you collect a lot of light and you focus it down onto a detector, or, you know, today we do it on, onto our eyes. And, and so the idea is that you now not have a pupil of like, you know, maybe a centimeter for the kids and, you know, a few millimeters for the adults, but actually have maybe a one meter or here eight meters of light collected onto, you know, a very concentrated uh, focal plane. Now, the problem on Earth is that um, we have an atmosphere. Now, for us, this is really important. Um, but for observing, especially the night sky, it's actually not that great because as we you know, have seen over the last few weeks, right, um, the weather um, is a major problem for us. And so what we do is actually we go to space. And so we have built the Hubble Space Telescope, um, which includes a slightly smaller mirror than you can see here. It's only about two to three meters. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's very powerful because it is in space. You don't have to worry about the atmosphere that blurs your light. And so you can take very, very sharp images how sharp, you might ask? Well, it's about 0.1 arc second. And you say, like, well, what's, what's 0.1 arc second? Well, this corresponds to is if I would take a car, drive to San Francisco, which I cannot do, but you know, let's assume we have a car in San Francisco that turns around and turns on its headlights. And here from Cambridge, we would be able, you know, with the Hubble Space Telescope to tell apart these two front headlights. Okay, so this is like the resolution we have with such a telescope. And so what we have been doing with this telescope, well, this is an interesting image. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Um, many of you have, have might seen it, right? And this image has been taken over many, many years, you know, collecting a lot of lights with, you know, the Hubble Space Telescope. And it is kind of funny because the idea was to observe a dark spot on the sky where there was nothing, you know, seen before. There was nothing there. There was no galaxy known. And when I was just taking a picture for several weeks, and combines this image then, and you can see what has been observed, right? These are not just a few tens of galaxies, these are of the order of about 3,000 galaxies that you can see in this image. And so the idea now, what we try to do, is try to reconstruct the cosmic history from images such as those. Because if you take, you know, such images, what you're doing actually, is you are observing galaxies at different distances, and then you can, you're able to reconstruct of how the galaxy population has evolved with cosmic time, right? So you can go back, not anymore, just millions of years, because I told you, like, the closest neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy, is about two million light years away, right? Now we are looking billion years into the past, and we can try to find, you know, when did the very first galaxies actually form in the universe? And so you might ask now, well, okay, we have taken these images with the Hubble Space Telescope. Why do you want to spend $10 billion and build a new telescope and put it into space? And the answer is not so simple, actually. Well, as you can see in this image here, as a, you know, it shows you a kind of a size comparison between the two instruments. Well, on the one hand, you want to have a larger mirror. You want to collect even more light, right? Because if you can collect more light, you can find fainter objects and you can look further away. 
The other answer is a bit more complicated why you want to build something more complex. Hubble, when we look back in time, so this is present day, this is today, and we can look back, we can see modern galaxies close by, and the further back we look, we can start seeing kind of the first galaxies and the first stars, but Hubble cannot see that. Hubble is basically blind to the very first galaxies, and this is because the Hubble Space Telescope works mostly in the optical. This is the light that we can see. But in order to probe the very, very first galaxies, we need to look at even rather longer wavelengths. And why is that the case? Because when we look at the very first galaxies that formed in the universe, they were sending out their light when the universe was much smaller. And then the universe expanded with cosmic time, and this led the, 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 the light to be expanded as well. And you can see that we're starting out with very blue light, but that blue light has been transformed into red light. And so what we need to do is we need to observe these, these galaxies actually in the red light, right? So if we would split, if you make a rainbow, right? If you take a prism, or a, you know, and you would split the, the rainbow, and you can see the light actually comes in many different wavelengths. What we see here, you know, Hubble is focusing mostly at the visible. That's what the light that we can see. But the James Webb Space Telescope expands this much more further into the red, in particular into the infrared. So this is the, the radiation that we can see, or the light, that we actually not can directly see, but we can feel it. So when you turn on the stove, for example, and you feel it's warm. So it's basically infrared radiation, sometimes called you know, the radiation of the heat, of the, of the warmth. And so this is the main reason why we built a new telescope, right? We want to look further back in time, and so we need to look more into the red. And so you might ask, well, did you, why did you build it like this? Why does it look like this, right? Well, first, you know, I mean, at least my kids were always wondering, like, so what's this thing here, right? Um, and, and the answer to this is that this is the sun shield. Because we want to detect infrared radiation, we have to cool this instrument down to minus 200 degrees Celsius and below that. And so you need to really shield it well from all the light of the sun, from the light from the earth, and so on. So you, you build this extra weird feature that, that is actually the size of a tennis court. So it's, it's pretty, pretty large. And the other feature that you might see looks interesting is this kind of golden mirror. And so you might ask, why did we you know, put golden mirrors there? And this is because gold reflects infrared radiation much better you know, than any other material. It's about 99%. And you say, well, okay, that's, that's cool, right? We can go up to space and steal the gold. But actually, when you look at how much gold there is, it's about you know, five wedding rings of gold that has been put on you know, very, very thinly. So it's not, not really worth flying up there, I think. You spend more money for the trip than what you get there with gold. And so then where, where did we put it? Well, the telescope itself is actually not you know, flying around the Earth as um, Hubble does. It's at this Lagrangian point two, which is actually beyond um, the orbit of the Earth. And you can see we, build it, we put it there because in this way you can place the telescope in a way that you never face the sun or the earth or the moon. And so you can use this sun shield here to really shield very effectively all the radiation from the sun and, and you can observe very well. You can cool your telescope down. Now, it is a huge telescope. I told you, like, the sun shield itself is the size of a tennis court, right? It's a huge, huge thing. So how do you bring it into space? You have to do what? What do you think, guys? Kids. Yes? Exactly, yeah. So you have to fold it up, right? Put it in a rocket and then, you know, lift it up. And, and yeah, this is how it looks roughly, right? So it, about, you know, two days after lunch. So here's the Earth, here's the Moon. So you can see the trace, like it has been launched from French Guiana in South, uh, um, you know, South America. And it has, you know, moved away from the Earth. And it has been wrapped up, as you just said. And so what happened then is basically we had to unfold it, as you just said. And that sounds like easy, right? We just pack it up, we unfold it in space. But there were of the order of about 300 you know, mechanisms that had to be executed step in step so that the unfolding was working without any problem. And it has worked. And I shall show you here, basically, what you see here is like, you know, the sun shield is coming down. It has been totally wrapped up like an or origami, basically. And then in the second phase, you started, um, you know, to unfold it um, sideways. 
And again, this took several days. It's not something that we just did in an afternoon. You can see up here how many days after lunch, you know, these processes took place. And again, you can see here, these are the hours, these are the minutes. So, you know, like we're spending here, you know, we're going very fast, right? Like it took days and hours to, to unfold this telescope. And it was, it was really uh, very nerve-wracking. A lot of people were very nervous about this process because if that failed in any of these 300 steps, we, we, we couldn't use it the way we wanted to use it, basically. And so what you see here now is basically that the sun shield is made up of like five layers and it, it, it really shields the telescope from all the, the radiation. And also at the very end, what you can see here is that, you know, the mirror has also been actually, you know, kind of folded up. And it will be placed in a few seconds. Yeah, well, I'm, I will move forward. So when the mirror is unfolded, it looks like this. And you can just see like a human as a comparison. I myself, I work in particular with one, one instrument that's called the NearCam instrument, which takes most of the images that you see, okay? There are a lot of other instruments on board that also want to do spectroscopy, but I will focus a bit more on the imaging side because this is a bit easier to understand. And I just show you here a few of these nice images have been taken in the very first, you know, few days of the mission, basically. And I could talk about all of them for a very long time, but I know that all of you won't probably go out and observe the real sky, although it, it doesn't look that beautiful. It's all, all black-white, uh, but, but anyway, uh, I'm happy to talk more about those images. I want to focus here a bit more on like really the early cosmic times, right? How do we find the very first galaxies? And what you see here is like the first Hubble, uh, the first JWST um, deep field. And what you see here is that these galaxies, these white galaxies are in the foreground. They are very, very big and very massive and they are lensing the background galaxies. And so you can see that they look kind of twisted, but this helps us to look further back in time. And so we already found some very, very red, very compact objects, which emitted their light over 13 billion years ago. Okay, so the universe is about 13.8 billion years old. And so these galaxies emitted their light a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And Today, we are able to collect the light, the photons of those galaxies. And now what we want to do is we want to study actually, you know, what are, what, what are these objects? And so what we can do is we can now do again the rainbow, we can disperse the light and we can measure certain emission features. So what you can see here are different elements and their emission lines. And so from this, we can learn, for example, what kind of stars there are in those, these galaxies. How quickly are the stars forming? What is, you know, how, how many metals are there? And this tells a lot about the formation mechanisms of those very, you know, early galaxies. We can also look at the structure of the galaxies and there were a few surprises. So for example, this is the same patch of sky. This is showing you the Hubble image and this shows you the image from the James Webb Space Telescope. And you can see that, oh, there are these objects appearing. And that's why we want to look into the red wavelengths because we have been, seems at least in these very first images, missing a lot of these very red, disky galaxies. And we think that they are red, not because they're just far away, but they're red also because they have a lot of dust. Okay, so these kind of small particles that scatter and absorb the blue light. Another very interesting galaxy that we found is this galaxy here. Um, it is not that far away. I mean, it's still, you know, the light traveled to us for about 11 to 12 billion years, so it's still very, very distant. But the interesting feature of this galaxy seems that it has a lot of X-ray emissions, so, you know, photons that have a very, very high energy. And so this galaxy is blooming in X-rays, and you ask, like, what is going on there? And so the idea that we have is that there seems to be in the very center of this galaxy actually a black hole that is accreting mass, that is accreting gas, and the gas that gets accreted onto this black hole is heating up to millions of degrees Celsius, and so this leads then to X-ray emission that we can then observe. Another, um, you know, interesting science that we can do with these images is actually combining the different telescopes. So here is showing you the Hubble image of a nearby galaxy. And this shows you the infrared image that we get from the James Webb Space Telescope. You can see that these images look very different, but this is the same galaxy. And so what we can do is we can study different phases of the galaxy. In this image, we can see the very young stars, kind of here in red, and kind of the older stars, more in kind of, you know, yellow. And then on the right, you can see, you know, it looks much more like the gas and the dust. And so we can learn about, you know, how actually the gas falls into galaxies, how it cools and how it's forming stars. And you can, you know, 
not see how this moves because you know change is taking you know millions of, of years uh, but we can try to understand like what are the key physical mechanisms to make it appear as it does in these images so I think I have one minute left and so I just want to show you some of the data that we have been um, working on so Again, I didn't sleep that much last few weeks because we have been collecting a lot of images. And the image that I show you now um, has been taken over the last three weeks. It's a, about 4,000 exposures. And nobody basically us, except our scientists, have seen this image. It's not public because we want to do a lot of science with it. And what it shows you basically, uh, it's at 1, 2, and 4 microns. So it's kind of the longer wavelength, as I've discussed with you before. It's, it's kind of showing the near infrared. And, and again, it's not like super, you know, it's not super great for, you know, outreach purposes, but I try to make it, you know, interesting. So what I see here is basically a patch of the sky. And what I do is I zoom in now, okay? So this is actually kind of a significant fraction on the sky. So what you can see here are probably of the order of 100 to 200,000 galaxies. Okay, so it's, it's really a lot of data and a lot of galaxies. And so I just want to zoom in and I show you a little bit like, you know, how, how this looks. And so this is really the first time we can now see at these wavelengths with this depth. So it's the deepest image that we have ever taken, basically at 2 and 4 micron with this high resolution. Okay, before this was much blurrier, and now we can start seeing the structure. And you can find very interesting, you know, objects. I mean, I could, you know, you can zoom around, play around with this data for, for days, um, and you can zoom in and... You know, there is a lot of substructure. If you, if you have it on the PC, you can basically see also a lot of smaller red objects that seem to be really, really far away. So it's really, really cool data. Okay, I just want to highlight, that, you know, all of this work has been done with a large team. And, you know, I mentioned to you the telescopes. Again, you know, the James Webb Space Telescope is not something that we just build in our backyard. It's a $10 billion mission. It's a large collaboration between NASA, ESA, and the Canadian Space Agency. And only with these large teams, we are nowadays able to really push the science forward. Okay, so thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions um, you might have. Thank you. So, so yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, to Sandra. I think, I'm, I'm sure everyone is keen to get started, and there's probably time for, um, I tell you what, should we do maybe like kind of one quick question? And then if you have any more questions, maybe you could stay behind and have a chat with the speaker. And if you want to go and do stargazing, we'll go outside. So maybe time for one quick question, and then we'll sort of split, split the team. At the back. Uh, how do you know how far away it is what you're looking at? Yes. So the question is, um, you know, how do we know how far it is what we're looking at? And, and the answer to this is that we don't, are not always 100% sure. But... If we have, if we can do the rainbow, if we can split the light and observe these emission features, you know, we know exactly the rest frame wavelength. We know exactly what these features are and at which wavelength they, they should be emitted. Now, when we observe things that are very far away because of this expansion effect, you know, the whole spectrum gets red shifted. And by comparing now the value that we know from the laboratory at which wavelength, for example, a certain emission feature should be and the one that we observe, we can then estimate how far away it is. Yes. So first of all, the matter between us and there distorts the light, and there is a bit of, a, of, a, of this kind of lensing effect. But um, there, more importantly, there is also a lot, uh, there is some gas in between. So there is some hydrogen between us and most of those galaxies, which also absorbs some of the light, in particular shorter wavelengths, which we can then use also to learn about how, thing, how far away things are. Wonderful. Okay, so, uh, so, yeah, so if, you, if you have any more questions for Sandro, feel free to stay behind. Uh, otherwise, uh, we can follow uh, Sam over there, who is waving. Uh, and first of all, let's thank our speaker again. <laughs>